You are here at the Empowerment Zone, and we are celebrating one year and 100 episodes. And in July, we had that incredible um, accomplishment. Uh, welcome to season two of the Empowerment Zone. I am your host, Ramona Houston. Make sure you check all of our episodes out and share them with your network. And also, please rate us on Apple Podcasts. That will help us immensely in growing our audience. Also, please visit my website, RamonaHouston.com, to fill out our survey. Uh, through your input, we're able to develop a program that appeals to you. As always, we are here to empower you. Welcome to the Empowerment Zone with Ramona Houston, where we zone in on black and brown relations and our journey to empowering our communities. Music is one of the arts that inspires and empowers many of us. And in each generation, there are artists uh, who push the limits in terms of innovation and creativity. And right now, Atlanta, America, and the world are inspired by Russell Gunn and his Royal Crunk Jazz or Orchestra. And today we're gonna talk uh, uh, to Mr. Uh, Russell Gunn, who's a composer, arranger, and musician, and he just released his uh, latest CD, The Serious Mystery, uh, through the Royal Crunk Jazz Orchestra. Born in Chicago and raised in East St. Louis, Illinois, Russell Gunn is a Pan-African composer, producer, and trumpeter. While his initial musical interest was American hip-hop, he has been celebrated as a jazz trumpeter from his early years to this day. In high school, uh, Gunn was named best all-around trumpet player in the country in a field that included college and professional players. Gunn declined scholarships from major universities, including Berkeley School of Music, to attend the historically Black college, Jackson State University. In 1993, Russell moved to New York, performing as a member of the Wynton Marcellus Big Band, known now as the Jazz at the Lincoln Center. He was in the trumpet section with Marcus Prinup and Roger Ingram and on the Pulitzer Prize winning jazz oratorio, Blood on the Fields, composed by Marcellus. His first recording was with uh, the great alto saxophonist and St. Louis native Oliver Lake on the album, Tribute to Eric Dorsey. Russell, um, excuse me, Eric Dolphy, excuse me. Russell Gunn has performed with the best in contemporary music, Oliver Lake, Branford Marcellus, Jazz at the Lincoln Center, Maxwell, D'Angelo, Angie Stone, Jimmy Heath, Roy Hargrove, Big Band, Lou Reed, CeeLo Green, Neo, Marcus Miller, Benny Golston, Young Jeezy, Joy, Les Nubian and Harry Connick Jr., and so many more. He has achieved two Grammy nominations for the albums Ethnomusicology, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Gunn is the founder, composer, and director of the contemporary big band, the Royal Crunk Jazz Orchestra, with two releases today, Get It How You Live and Pyramids. Get It How You Live introduces us to the band, expressing their contemporary style and leading us toward Gunn's seminal work, a trilogy that represents the artist's search to tell the expansive story of the African diaspora and the rich history it carries. Pyramids is the first in a three album set that carries us further into Gunn's world of discovery and expression. Pyramids delves musically into the true splendor of the comedic and Nubian peoples, whose accomplishments have been buried through years of rewritten European history. In the second album titled The Serious Mystery, Russell Gunn goes further into the concept of oral tradition that has been overwritten by the European technology. Following an ancestry of tracing, Gunn found his roots in Mali, which piqued his interest in the country and, sp and specifically the doggone uh, people. People whose knowledge of space and planetary positions has stunned other African peoples and has brought forth the ire of the Euro Eurocentric scholars eager to dispute that any knowledge could have predated theirs, particularly the doggones. The intent is serious. 
Gunn is on a mission to contribute his knowledge through art to our further understanding for the world we have inherited. Welcome, Mr. Russell Gunn. I am happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, before we get there, before we delve into your uh, latest release, The Serious Mystery, um, can you give our audience a little bit about your background, your personal history and uh, how you uh, got into music? OK, um, I mean, it, it's I don't know, it's just it's quite a interesting and a long story, but I guess the to um to um, put it in a, in a in a neat nutshell is that I mean musically I've always been it's always been what I what I've done even before I became um, even before I, I took up the instrument the trumpet at the age of ten even before that I was always like like most um, musicians I grew up um, going to church every every Sunday and um, I used to um, what first what first caught my attention was was the um, the organ in the church just because of how it looked and I was um, completely amazed that um, there were so many keys on so many keys on that thing and and the and the and the organ player would could 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 make people feel a certain way by the way he was man, uh, manipulating all of all of the devices and the keys on the thing so that you know that initially piqued my interest and in, you know long story short um you know back in the day when there was still music in the school mostly I mean from an early age in school so at the age of 10 uh, um, I took up the trumpet and that's um pretty much how I got started in 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 music per se, uh, per se so what what how did, how did trumpet become your voice of choice well, <clears throat> well actually the reason I, tro I chose the trumpet is, I mean, it's not even a real reason. I wanted to, well, you know, in the fourth grade, in the old days, when um, they would ask you, uh, when, if you were interested in playing an instrument, they would ask you which instrument you wanted to play. And initially, I, wa I wanted to play the saxophone because all of the, um, you know, all of the songs on the radio, if they had a solo in them, it was either a guitar solo or a saxophone solo. And I... And, you know, and so that's what I identified with. So that's what I wanted to play. But it just so happened, um, my best friend at the time, he um, he wanted to play trumpet. And he's like, he was like, come on, man, let's play trumpet together. I was like, all right, I don't care. I mean, you know, I just wanted to to play some music. So, and that's the reason I, I started playing the trumpet, actually. So looking at your evolution in, uh, you say you were born in Chicago and raised in East St. Louis. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any influences uh, that help to contribute to your interest in, in pursuing music uh, during your time in East St. Louis? Because so many greats came out of East St. Louis when you look at the arts, mm -hmm. uh, Catherine Dunham, Miles Davis, mm -hmm. uh, um, St. Louis, the dancer, Josephine Baker was out of St. Louis, not East St. Louis, but there are many others that came out of East St. Louis. What but Baker was from East St. Louis. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought she was, but she, I thought she was St. Louis all this yeah, time. She's an East St. Louis South End girl. Mm. So with that being said, what were your influences in terms of, and I'm not just talking about professionals, I'm talking about educationally too. Mm -hmm. Who were your influence that made you want to pursue uh, music and, and, and move forth in that career? Well, like, as I said, I, uh, I started playing the trumpet and, and, <clears throat> naturally I don't think I, I wasn't really I'm not really a gifted um trumpet player naturally but playing a trumpet is it's um it's a really hard thing to do <laughs> I mean it's a really difficult instrument to um not only learn but to actually get decent at and I'm not even talking about getting good at or being a master at I'm just talking about being decent enough so throughout like my junior high school days, I was always like the worst trumpet player, set way at set set way at the end. Um, but when I got to high school, um, my it, there was a um, the high school jazz ensemble. There were only two high schools in my, in my hometown, and Lincoln High School was one, and 
East St. Louis Senior High School was the other. So, and I, I wanted to go to Lincoln High School because they had a really, really good uh, jazz ensemble. And, and I, I just wanted to be a part of that. But what I didn't know is that when I got there, I actually had a cousin that was in the band and he was, he was a senior <clears throat> during my first year of school. But he was, and he was a trumpet player also. His name is Anthony Wiggins. And he was the best. He was, he was, um, you know, he was the one that um, all of the all of the schools want, all of the colleges wanted, all of all of the girls in school wanted, all of the girls in the band wanted, and that's the, what I wanted. <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, that's what I want. So, <laughs> so I got to practicing, and um, in in between my first year and my second year, I, I grew as uh, musically a, a, about as much as you can grow, and. It was it was that desire, that desire for attention, and then also fortuitous for something fortuitous happened is that you know um, my my family's from Chicago, so in the summers I would go stay with my grandmother in Chicago, and it just so happened that my grandmother um, was dating or used to date. My grandmother was only thirty five when I was born, so <laughs> so she's like 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 my mother's age, you know, or someone's mother's age. So um, she was either dating or had dated someone, a man, his name is Leon Cole. He was a DJ in Chicago and he, and he DJed, um, he, he spun jazz on, I don't know um, what radio station it was, but all of his albums were at her house. And, and, and in the, so in the summer, that first summer, my first year of high school, all I did was go, I would just I just sat in the room and listened to records and tried to imitate that first year. And that's how I got uh, to um, to get as good as I got in, in, in high school. And, and of course, it helped that our high school band director's name was Ron Carter, not to be confused with the bassist Ron Carter. But he was. Um, um, Every time I talk about him, it's kind of hard to, to um, put into words the kind uh, the man he was and what he meant to all of us, because he was um, um, it was it was more than just like a musical education. It was like a father figure for for uh, most most of us. Um, even I grew up with my dad, so uh, I had a dad at home, but you know the vast majority didn't, and um, so he was a father figure to most for, um, to most other people gave us somewhere to be um, during those those dangerous times in, the, in East St. Louis in the 80s where, you know, if you weren't, if you didn't have somewhere to be, being on the street, it was only going to take you one place. And um, so, yeah, so um, those two, that combination of those two things um, pretty much set me on my path. Yeah, it's so interesting how family, friends, and educators really help to shape our lives and really direct us to where our um, purpose is meant to be. And so thank you for sharing your personal story and background with us on how Russell Gunn became Russell Gunn in terms of the musician. Um, let's move on to this latest recording, man. I tell you, when I saw the cover on Facebook, I was like, man, I can't wait to talk to Gunn about this. I was just so excited. And I've read a little, you know, excerpt about it. And so I'm really excited to uh, get to your interpretation of the serious mystery. But before we move on to the album, can you give us a little bit of background of you know, how did you come up with this concept of the Royal Crump Jazz Orchestra? And, you know, wh why did you choose to explore creatively with a big band? And then let's move on and, and talk, to, talk to our audience about uh, your latest recording. Okay. Well, I mean, the reason, the reason that I, uh, I formed the big band in the first place, I mean, quite honestly, it was a long time coming. I just didn't have... Um, I guess the, um, the education to actually pull it off until um, I guess um, fairly recently, and 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 it's two things. One thing, the way the way I write music, I've always written with a larger, um, a larger, a sense of a larger ensemble in mind. Even though um, you know I might write small group stuff, 
But most of the music, most of my recorded music has always been for uh, an ensemble, not as large as a big band, but it, you know, it always had multiple, uh, multiple horns and and a in a in a conception to it. And but the but thing about composition and arranging is that um, you know somebody has to teach you that stuff, and and I was never taught that. I had to. I basically had to teach myself. I taught myself how to, um, you know, to arrange, and I taught myself. Um, well, composition is different because com composing is um, that's one thing, but arranging it takes a, it takes a little bit of um, of of of, of know how, and so I didn't learn in school. I left school after after just um, two years, and I never studied any kind of composition or arranging. But I. Um, so I basically learned how to do it through trial and error. And, um, and you know, I can remember like the, the very first time I tried, I was like, oh my God. And I, and I, and I, and I gave the music to the band and, the, and the, the sound came back. I was like, man, what? I was like, cause I, you know, cause I just didn't understand the math of it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I've always written for a large ensemble, but I just now, through a lot of trial and error and self-learning that I figured out um, how to uh, how to actually execute it, I guess. So why the big band Royal Crunk Jazz Orchestra? Um, what you made title? you? No, no, not oh. the title, but why did you form? You know, like you stated, even in a small group, you've always had a larger, smaller group. You know, when you mm -hmm. look at the ensemble. But now you mm -hmm. moved to big band. Why the big band? What what made you form a big band? Well, like I said, I, I finally I finally thought that I that I that I was um, you know able enough to write for a large ensemble without having to sound like trash. And <laughs> um, so that's what I so that's what I did. It, you know, every I mean, I guess every every journey or every step in the journey is just like one building block or one step to leading up to where, wherever you're trying to go. And this is where I was trying to get to. Um, it took it took a while for me to get there because I had to learn it myself. But um, I'm glad I I'm glad I learned it, you know, in hindsight, I think I'm glad I learned it this way. Because I do remember some of the um, my freshman classes in in um, in college about um European um European art. Uh, arranging I guess it, and with, 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 the, with the rules with the very strict rules and, and things you could do and things you couldn't do which you know sometimes you know they're there for a reason because um, they kind of glue everything together it's, it's really hard to describe but when you have a conception in your head it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to understand like um European rules of, of, of harmony and 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 um, and how harmony is supposed to work in composition. And you have this other African thing on this other act. You have this African side of you saying, "Yeah, but it's a sound. I want it to be like this." And then the rules are like, "Yeah, but if you do that, it's gonna be like." So it took a long. It took a while for me to figure out how to to make them both work. So you know, it's like you're merging these two different approaches to music you know when you look at the African side it's a little bit more free you know without the rules versus the rules in the on the European side who are some of your um, favorite composers when you talk about big band and and how they influenced you as a, a as a composer and director of a big band well I mean you can't mention an African uh, or African-American big band without the big two of Duke Ellington and, and Count mm -hmm. Basie. Mm -hmm. And um I I would lean my band more towards a Count Basie mm. type of band because it's more about the what what, what. <sighs> yeah I don't want to say that because I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna say something that was gonna come back and, and somebody was gonna get <laughs> so I I um yeah and the re the reason I would say that I, I'm more of a Count Basie type of type of ensemble um, is because of um, Duke Ellington's harmonic sophistication is is 
um, something that I uh, I don't do, even though I mean my harmony is sophisticated enough, and um, I'm, you know it's not like um, you know basic ABCs or something like that. I mean there's words that you got to understand the meaning of, but um, Duke Ellington's um, harmonic sophistication was so 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 advanced. It's, it's um it's uh, it almost you would almost do yourself a do yourself and him a disservice when you um kind of go in that direction. And I'm only talking about harmonically. Now, the feeling that you get by listening to the band, it's all the same. Um, you know, those bands play on the rhythm of the swing rhythm. And, and you know, I mean, you feel it a certain way. My band, I use I use a more modern rhythm, but, it, but it's the same concept. It's like you feel you're supposed to feel the same way. It's, it's supposed to make you feel the same way as if, uh, like if you're listening to some African drums. If you listen to some African drums, you feel a certain way automatically. Same way when you're listening to Duke Ellington, you feel a certain way automatically. And it's the same feeling. And and hopefully when you listen to my band, rhythmically, you feel the same way. And uh, so, uh, but as, as far as composers go, well, my well my most favorite arranger is, is Benny Gosling. I, I think he's... um. Yeah, he's like, he's like my idol. Yeah, um, it's a it's a small group arranger. <clears throat> um, he's um to me he's he's um it, it doesn't get any better than that. As far as as large ensembles go, my favorite composer is this Russian. He's a Russian composer named um, Peter Tchaikovsky. Mm -hmm. To me, um, is he he's the greatest composer that I've ever heard. I, and there's a lot of great. A lot of great composers that have walked the earth and are walking the earth now. But to me, the way he um, dealt with um, uh, melody, um, it, 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 everything else pales in comparison it, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, all you have to do is think about all of those songs in the Nutcracker, mm -hmm. and then and you'll know that. Nobody could write another be like Tchaikovsky, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. And that's what I try to. That's what I try to get to. Have um, melody and rhythm and harmony all together, but giving you a certain feeling. So yeah. So yeah, Tchaikovsky is my guy as a composer. Benny Gosen is my guy as an arranger. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> so tell us about why you chose that name, the Royal. Uh, crunk jazz orchestra what what's the origin of that name okay yeah well the the origin it, it actually predates the bands is um years ago and i'm not sure what year it was i made a record just on uh, not for a label but just on my own because i started hearing this music in my head <clears throat> and um and it was like these modern these modern modern rhythms that Kind of predate the, the um, trap trap beat sound, but that that era right before that that Atlanta that Atlanta type sound. So I was so I was writing these melodies and um, um and and bass lines and stuff to go along with that um, rhythmic concept. And also um I, um, I had I was working with um, a saxophone player named Daryl Reese, and we were working working on um, music um, that kind of kind of fit that rhythmic concept together. And um and we actually had a we actually had a performance and one of the singers, well the only singer that I had on the on, on the um performance that we were gonna have a um, great singer named Julie Dexter. She was um she told me that she was um sitting in her car um listening to the demo trying to learn the lines and she said a, a, a little kid walked up to her car and it's like Oh man, man, what's that right there? She's like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm just listening to some music. I'm trying to learn some music. She's like, and then she said, the kid said, Oh man, that sounds like some crunk jazz right there. <laughs> and then so, yeah, so she told me that, and then the meeting. So, and that's been the, you know, what I what I call my conception of music now. Yeah, you know that crunk. Crunk uh, for our audience. That's a ATL a Atlanta word. Crunk. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and so it's it, it's interesting that you move that with it being an Atlanta-based orchestra that you put that name uh, in in as the title of your orchestra. Um, so I can't wait to talk about the serious uh, mystery. Um, like I said, I was just really, really intrigued by the cover of the CD and, uh, you know, reading some of the reviews and, and, and synopsis of what the music is and what you meant uh, in terms of uh, the serious mystery. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, your concept and why you chose uh, to write about the series and what, what is the meaning of that album cover? Okay. Well, first, I, I think the first thing I, I have to do is try to explain the overall conception. And, and it's really hard to do. And I haven't really figured out, I've done a lot of interviews and I've never really figured <laughs> out a way to, 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 to make it um, sound like I make sense. But... <laughs> We, the, the previous recording is called Pyramids, and the new recording is called The Serious Mystery. And then there's another um, record that's not out yet. It'll be out maybe next year or the year after. The purpose of the three of the three albums or the three bodies of work is that they're really all one body of work. And um, what I'm what I'm trying to do is uh, artistically kind of tell the story of, uh, of Africans in its entirety. And I know that's something that you can't do in, in, a, you know, in, in three hours, but trying to give an overall, uh, an, an overall view of the big picture. Now, in, and when I talk about the big picture, I'm talking about um, time, and I'm talking about the vast, vast amount of time that um, people have been on this earth and the vast amount of time that Africans have been doing these spectacular things <clears throat> on earth. And I'm talking, when I'm talking about time, I'm talking about time that we can't even measure, like, like from a, from a rational standpoint, it's like, when you think about time, you think like, you may, you know, like a hundred years. No, I ain't talking about a hundred <laughs> years. I'm talking about <laughs> thousands and thousands of years each, um, in each period. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, the records are the records that, that I'm I'm making are a little out of order. Pyramids is actually the second part, and and pyramids deals with that particular um, time, those thousands and thousands of years in which uh, those monuments began to spring up all over the earth, and of, of course, they are all of um, um, Egypto Nubian origin, and um, but. Um, but you can find them in South America, China, mm -hmm. wherever. In, 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 different, in different variations, of course, they don't all look like the, the Giza Plateau. Um, East St. Louis, where I'm from, mm -hmm. there's a whole, there's yep. a whole um, pyramid structure. Yep. We were in school, they used to call they, they, um, the official name, was it was the Cahokia Mounds, and they told mm -hmm. us it was just Indian Mounds. And it wasn't until I started working on this stuff that I went and I looked back and I was like, "That's some bullshit." <laughs> so I see what pyramids and I and I and you know, I mean, you know, you grow up, you grow up less than you know, just a few miles from this gigantic pyramid of structure and not even and not even realize it. But anyway, so that's those thousands and thousands of years, and you know, and I'm trying to keep it um, in a nutshell so it doesn't take forever to explain. Now the first part deals with a with, with a with a subject, the serious mystery, it deals with subject matter that's a little that's really harder to kind of um, grasp or accept if you um, think a certain way. And it and it and it deals with uh, a time far before the pyramid times. And it is and it, it deals with a time um, that um uh, and this is all um, you know um, Griot, word of mouth, passed down um, stories, lessons um, that may seem far fetched, but if you look at uh, if you look at the lineage of, of of these tales, the evidence is there that you know there's something about it. So anyway, the serious mystery deals with um, 
first contact basically it deals with it deals with um the um the the, the conception of 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 africans and uh extraterrestrials and it deals and it deals with um after that it deals with africans um having this vast knowledge of of the solar system and all of these things um in outer space that predate modern technology science things that just make no sense for um uh, and, and in particular in particular a tribe like the dogon tribe who lives in Mali, uh, who lives in Mali with um little to no tech um technology now to have this to have been passing down this um this um knowledge about things in outer space that everybody thought they were crazy for hundreds and hundreds of years until uh, they invented um telescopes powerful enough to be like oh shit <laughs> I guess I guess they I guess I guess they I guess they knew what they were talking about. It's it's actually there. But um I mean in um uh, I mean, so so I mean and it's and like I said it's really hard for me to try to explain in in a in a in a you know in a condensed um setting uh, about um that that beginning that beginning stage but just know that 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 time predates my time my time the timeline of pyramids by thousands and thousands and thousands of years also so the third part which it um which will be which we'll do next year and that's going to be called the valley of the dry bones and that's going to be um and that deals with this time and um, um, this time and space that we're in now, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure how how far back um, on, on the timeline I'm, I'm actually um, going, but it's it it pretty much starts after Africans were already were already in America and it and it's and it's around and it starts around that time and it deals with that. So we're gonna deal with Okay, that. hold up, hold up. But when you talk about are you talking about the old mix or are you talking about Africans in the new world? Which which one are you referring well, to when you talk about Africans, uh the the beginnings of Africans over here? Well at the end of pyramids, the recording pyramids, I the last the last three sections of that is dedicated to those is dedicated to the omics, and so that's so the the um, the um, the next recording pretty much picks up at that point up until now. So yeah, we talk yeah with um o omic, Aztec, Toltec, um, everything from Central America to South America to Peru. We, we that's all that's all um we, we I talked about that um musically at the um as the last section of pyramids and it's and to, to tie it into what we're talking about and it's because i think the last three sections of pyramids is the voyage of the pyramid builders which talk which i'm talking about those africans moving out into the rest of the world all met and um the pan and then the last part is Called the Pan African Benediction because um, that's when we're going to start talking about this story of us where we are now on the next recording. So I don't know if that, any of that makes sense or all of it makes sense. It, it's, it's really hard to try to. Explain yeah, it's, it's very. It, yeah, and 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 it's a large vision. That's why it's hard to say in a few words. You're talking about from the beginning until now, right? Uh, and musically, how do you express that in three hours, like you stated? Um, that that's a challenging feat. Yeah. Well, I, it's like a it's like a movie. It's like mm -hmm. a, you can watch a movie and you can watch a, a biopic, and you know, get the bullet points in in two hours or three hours, and uh, I, and you know, it's never complete. Uh, it, you know, mm -hmm. But um. But that's 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 the attempt. It's you know it's like it's like 
a musical movie getting uh, the, ma the major points. Because I think once you have the major points, it, you can start examining all of the finer points that, that, uh, that, that kind of lie in between those, those points. And you're like, wait a minute, well, if this happened during this timeline, then that means that this, what they mm -hmm. said happened right there can't be right. Or mm -hmm. that means mm -hmm. that these people must look like this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So it's very interesting that you chose to include the doggones uh, in this story. So what was your journey in incorporating the doggones in, in the whole story of your CD cover? Uh, because I do know, um, well, anyway, let, let me let you answer that question. <laughs> well, the, the, the reason the doggone came into it in the first, well, First, let me backtrack, I guess. The serious mystery music I wrote before Pyramids, actually. Mm -hmm. I just didn't arrange it for the larger ensemble until after Pyramids. But the reason the reason I wrote the music in the first place, and it, and it wasn't it wasn't for anybody except for myself to know that I wrote this music, is because once I got uh, I had a um, you know the, the DNA um, traced to Africa and um, my DNA came back basically um, saying that pointed to this um, region in West Africa called Guinea-Bissau. And um, I was, so I was talking to um, a friend of mine and she's, um, she's French, but she's from Cameroon, I guess. Yeah, she's from Cameroon, but she's, um, she grew up in France. And she was, um, she, we were talking about that and she was, and she said, she thought that I, you know, my facial features, according to her, looked more like someone from Mali. And, and of course, I, um, and I didn't know a lot about Mali. I just knew, you know, the basics, uh, Timbuktu, a little bit about uh, Mansa Musa being the, the richest person that ever lived. I didn't know a lot. I just knew that. Um, so I went to go check it out. You know, but anybody, you know, you can, you can't tell me nothing, man. You tell <laughs> something, and I'm going to, I'm going to find out about it. So I went to start, um, um, start checking on it, and and um, of course, of course, I came across um the Dogon, and then that, and that just completely blew my mind. And 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 the more, the more I learned, the more I read, the more I, um researched. I mean, it was became completely mind blowing. And then the connection, that Egyptian connection that they have, and it's, you know, I'm a big believer in like, in, in like, in like facts. So I start, <laughs> I start checking out like the timeline, like time, timeline of world events. Mm -hmm. And I start and especially start looking at the, uh, the last dynasty in, in uh, the last dynasty in Egypt that, um, um, King Akhenaten was, mm -hmm. was, was um, and all of the things that went down during during his reign, and I was like, man, these these time the timelines kind of add up. I mean, I mean, I mean, of course, you know that you know we like like all of these Egyptian stories are the stories of of, of Christianity now. Just mm -hmm. just um, yeah. just it's just a, a reworded story. So man, I, I still start looking. I'm like, man, I think you know these these timelines are adding up for these people to be those people. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I think those <laughs> people are those people that did what they said these people did. I mean, I'm not gonna get in, into into um, all of that, but just know that like timeline wise, stuff started making making sense. Mm -hmm. And when I, and I started reading books about. Um, Dogon and, and the Dogon glyphs that mm -hmm. they and how they mm -hmm. were, and how they're um, similar and all of the and all of the, the how the symbols and, and what we call Egyptian hieroglyphs all are all meaning the same thing. It's like okay, and then and then together with the timeline, it's like okay. So yeah, so I the connection is is definitely is definitely that. Um, so. Um, that's uh, that's um, that's what got me started in on Mali, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew there was a personal connection with you to Mali, and I wanted you to share that with the with the audience. And so, when we look at the cover, what are we seeing? 
Well, the the cover of the series mystery, it actually it's actually um it's actually um coordinates coordinates and um, um space and um uh, I think there's four maybe in one of the coordinates um leads directly to uh, um Sirius and the other coordinate leads to Egypt. The other coordinate leads to Mali, mm. and the other coordinate leads to Atlanta. Mm. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you connect in all those coordinate coordinates through your own experience. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So congratulations on the release of the serious mystery. Um, I'm really happy for you and proud of you. Uh, congratulations on your success with the Royal Crump Jazz Orchestra. Um, one of my favorite performances uh, of you, I've seen you perform quite a bit, was during the um, Atlanta Jazz Festival in 2019 and in, in doing the Black National Anthem. I, that was just so moving. Uh, for those of you who want to check that out, I'm sure it's on YouTube, but that was just a I, that was just a spiritual experience for many in the audience. I thought it was just me, but there were a lot of people commenting af- after that. I heard a lot of conversations about that uh, performance, but congratulations. I look forward to seeing you perform The Serious Mystery, and um, I wish you much success uh, as you continue to uh, push the limits of music and continue to embrace and uh tell the story of people of African descent through music. I will. So we're moving on to our uh, college success portion of our interview. Um, So uh, Russell, can you tell us what school uh, did you attend? What was your major? And what is that strategy that you would give students for college success? Okay, well, first, as, as a, as a uh, full disclosure, I never finished college. And um, I wish I did, but I didn't. I did what um, a lot of um, athletes do, and I went pro. <laughs> I thought. I thought <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's it. I thought I was ready to be a professional musician, so I went for it. Um, but I, I mean, I, I always, I always wish I had, um, um, I, I had uh, finished what I started when it comes to that. So, but I will say this about college, and now it's because it, because it's in hindsight, and I do wish that I finished. Time moves so fast, mm. so quickly, and. It seems like four years or five years is like forever. And it's like, it's like, oh man, you know, four years of college, it seems like a long time. The time goes by so fast that you almost do yourself a disservice if you just don't go ahead and um, uh, and finish in the time because there's so there's, uh, there's going to be so much time after that that you could actually pursue your goals or see your goals and your dreams. Um, I wish I wish I would have stayed in school. Um, I really wish I would have stayed in school, just I would so I could have the option um, of of having uh, if I wanted to teach and I so and I had a degree. I don't have a degree. I mean, I it took like what we talked about earlier. It took me all of these years to learn all of this stuff uh, on my own about um, you know all of this on the job experience that I probably could have learned when when I was in school, but I chose not to. Um, so yeah, the 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 time, the t- it's very it's worth just buckling down and just go ahead and doing the time and getting it and go ahead and, and finishing that because before you know what that time is going to be over and you're going to be saying to yourself, man, I thought it was going. I thought this was. It seemed like when I walked on the yard as a, as a freshman, it just seemed like it was going to be forever before. And now it's like I'm wishing I was. You know, I'm wishing I was back there. That's why so many people leave college and they can't wait to go back to homecoming for the mm-hmm. next mm-hmm. three years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. 
Um, uh, yeah. So I mean, I mean, that's only I mean because I can't. I mean, I don't want to be. You know, I don't want to give people advice about something that I didn't do. Because you know, you know, I mean, what what kid wants to hear hear something? You know, it's like, well, you didn't do. It, you know, I don't. I don't, I don't want to be that person to tell, do as, you know, to be the old saying, do as I say, not as I do. But all I can do is give you, all I can say is that I wish I did. And I know that in hindsight, I, I actually had the time <laughs> to go ahead and finish school and that I thought I didn't have. But so yeah, that's it. Thank you for that uh, advice that if you decide to attend college and go to college, finish college, uh, whether you realize it or not, uh, that time will go by faster than what you think. And you are always able to go pro after you finish. So <laughs> finish college. <laughs> Thanks, Gun. We appreciate you being on the Empowerment Zone. Thank you. To learn more about Russell Gunn, the Royal Crunk Jazz Orchestra, and to purchase their latest CD, The Serious Mystery, visit rkjo.net. A special thank you to the incredible team of the Empowerment Zone. Terry on Gully, theme song, NADWORKS, digital support, and of course, our featured guest. If you enjoyed my podcast, please subscribe. We are on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Be sure to rate us on Apple Podcasts too. Thank you for your continued support.